Reverend, please be in prayer as we ready our hearts to worship Him. Word of God in Psalm 111, verse 1 to 4, read, Praise ye the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all them that have pleasure therein. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endure forever. He have made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. May we all arise and we shall worship the Lord in singing our first hymn, Hymn 25. The Lord is King.
Let's all remain standing as we look to the Lord in prayer. Lord God Almighty, the majestic King and yet the gracious and merciful Father in heaven, with total submission to thy unchallenged authority and righteousness, thy people come before thee once again on this blessed Lord's Day to honour, bless and worship thee. There is none besides thee. And thus we bow before thee, O triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, acknowledging that thou art indeed the Lord, the omnipotent, all-powerful, all-knowing, and from everlasting to everlasting. We are reminded from thy word that our Master has taught, that if men would hold their peace, refusing to sing thy praise, exalting thee, the very stones would immediately cry out. Foolish indeed, O Lord, is one who would choose to ignore thee, to disregard thy absolute sovereignty and all the marvellous, wondrous works thou hast wrought. Forgive us, O Lord, once again for all our sins, some so very evident to us and yet others, and some within the very depth of our heart. Cause us this day once again to come before thee with a broken spirit in humility and sincerity. Cleanse and sanctify us, clothe us in the perfect righteousness of our Lord, that we may do, say, or even think all oh, that are acceptable unto thee. Lord, thy word in Psalm 145, which we are so familiar with, reading from verse 1 and 3, given by inspiration of God, continues to be our motivation, our very cry to thy word that says, I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day will I bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. By thy gracious and mercy, O Lord, please honour our desire and prayer this morning for a joyful commitment unto thee, for thou art worthy to be praised. Be praised, O Lord, to receive all our praises with thanksgiving, whether in words, deeds, or thoughts. We thank thee once more for the various opportunities and gatherings of thy people throughout this day to worship thee and to be nurtured by thy precious word. Whether it be during this service or the earlier service that was held, the Mandarin service and the evening teaching service this evening, and also the junior worship service, May the Holy Spirit move freely among us all to cause some to repentance, resulting in their spiritual salvation, and yet for others for restoration and for the regaining of their joy and peace of the Lord. And so we would pray for all in the teaching ministry. that they will continue to serve thee not only this day but all the rest of their life joyfully and with steadfastness. We praise thee once more for being with our pastor and Deacon Locke, bringing them back safely from their short trip to Kuching. And we pray, Lord, that thou will be pleased to keep and to watch our pastor giving him strength this day to serve thee in the various meetings. Lay upon him what thou would want thy people to hear this day. Speak to us 
through him. That the people may say it was good to have come to the house of the Lord. We pray giving thanks in the most blessed and holy name of our Lord and Saviour. Amen. While remaining standing, let us now look and read together scripture. And this morning's scripture is taken from Psalm 15, verse 1 to 5. Psalm 15, verse 1 to 5, reading in unison. Psalm 15, let us begin with verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurts and changes not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doth these things shall never be moved. May the Lord add his richest blessings in the reading and meditation of his holy word. Please be seated. Now, we shall... Listen to the Gethsemane Church Choir giving their presentation to honor the Lord.
most encouraging him. And we shall continue to be encouraged this morning from yet another blessed hymn, 339, that talks about when I fear my faith would fail. Christ will hold me up. A very warm welcome to us all for joining us in our 11 a.m. worship service and also a very special welcome to those who may be following us live on the internet. If you have your weekly, you may refer to these items which I shall share with you. Take time to read Pastor's articles in the Sunday even, on the Sunday evening teaching service, as well as the junior's page. Some of us may ignore that, thinking that it's only meant for juniors, but there are really very wonderful words of counsel there for us as well. And in between are two testimonies from two of our sisters given during our prayer meeting as well as during the fellowship meeting that we had. Take time to read them. And the other items for your information, please take note that coming Saturday is another seminar for your benefit. 
please take time to join this particular seminar organized by the Young Mothers Fellowship Group. And it dwells on a very relevant, important topic. Teaching my child. Pastor will be bringing the message. And it's on this coming Saturday, 30th of July. And it runs from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. This will be held at the Gethsemane Media Center. And as usual, there will be a concurrent children's program aimed at children aged between 4 and 12. Please take note regarding the junior worship for our younger children. They're starting from the next Lord's Day, 31st of July. Teachers and children will be attending, who are attending the junior worship. Please come and join us in the auditorium for the first part of the program. And thereafter, after the singing and followed by the pastoral prayer, the classes were then dispersed to their respective venues. So please take note that this is a change for the benefit of our children and teachers starting from next Lord's Day. We're going to praise the Lord for 20 years of that fastness in the Chinese service ministry. And next Lord's Day at the 8.30 a.m. service, there will be a combined service to commemorate this particular wonderful event, the 20th anniversary of the Chinese service. It will be in both English and Mandarin at the 8.30 a.m. service. On GBI, please take note that Pastor will be teaching a class on the book of Ezekiel. And this is on Wednesday evenings at 7.30 p.m. And it begins on the 3rd of August. If you are interested, please sign up in the link provided in the bulletin. Some of us know about the plan to have our next Bible Witness Retreat, the 21st Bible Witness Retreat. And this will be held, God willing, from the 6th to the 8th of September. This is from a Tuesday to a Thursday. And the venue will be in Kuching, Sarawak, Malaysia. As further details become available, this will be announced. But there is a limit because of the Difficulty, I think, of getting uh, uh, flights, as well as perhaps the limitation in the venue's uh, room. So you are asked to sign up as soon as you can if you are really interested to go. The link is provided. Please take the opportunity to once again benefit from the Lord's servant in teaching this particular doctrine of repentance. So once again, the date is 6, of, 6 to the 8th of September. This falls during the school holidays to facilitate those who may be teachers as well as those who are, with parents, who are parents with young children. The Kababayan Bible Study will be meeting on the 5th of August, the first Friday, and it is on the 5th of August, 7.30 p.m., and you'll be held at the home of Sister Joy Del Rosario. The address is provided, and Preacher Jeremiah Sim will be bringing the word. As usual, on the back page are the announcement regarding the account codes, bank account codes that you can use to channel your offerings to the church together with a QR code provided there to facilitate that particular transaction instead of entering the, the account, <coughs> excuse me, the, the account number. And secondly, gives to GBWL's work. The account is provided there as well. Or you could also use the bank pay now facility. Once again, a reminder about the church app, which is available for your downloading and use. When you get into that particular app, you see a lot of useful sermons and other resources for your spiritual growth. 
Here ends the announcement. I shall now ask Pastor to come and take over for the rest of the meeting. And this morning, Pastor will be sharing from Psalm 15 in the message entitled, The Man in God's House. Pastor, please. A blessed Sunday morning to one and all. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ abide with all of us as we seek Him this morning in prayer and in study of His Word. Eldama has announced um, a few things this morning, and I want to add a few thoughts to it. I've written an article encouraging all of you to come. Consider Sunday evening teaching service and come and uh, participate in this. Um, well, um, Sunday evening teaching service is a very important time for God's people to learn, especially in our church. Well, other churches have their own way. Nonetheless, it's not something I agree to. Now, I, the first two paragraphs of your article actually deals with the biblical and the historical, church historical reason why Sunday evening service is important. Now, in the Bible, we know the early Christians spent a lot of time uh, in studying God's word, fellowshipping, praising God, and praying. And especially on the Lord's day, they would spend the whole day in service to God, in worship of God. Now, we also know when God revived the church from time to time in the, in the past 2,000 over years, there will be always a commitment from God's people to take the Lord's day, the first day of the week, uh, to worship God and to learn God's word and do His will. Immediately after Reformation, we see a revival again in the church, in all Protestant churches, morning and evening service existed for 400 more years. It's only at the turn of the last century, like the early uh, 1900s, you see apathy toward worship setting in in the church. And a lot of churches, Protestant churches, evangelical churches, however you call them, stopped their evening services. And just one service was a lot more than the members can take it. It's very strange. So the last 60 years, 50 to 60 years, we see evening service being completely wiped off from most denominations, most congregations. But we thank God that there are churches still have morning and evening service. Why is, our, why is there such a practice? Because it's biblical that we spend that day to worship God and to grow. It is the day God has appointed. The reason why the churches have failed because there was spiritual lethargy and too much of worldliness. We want to engage in secular activities visiting friends, doing marketing and shopping, engaging in physical exercise and entertainment. And so Sunday became a more secular day than a day that is for the worship and knowing of God's word. It's very sad, isn't it? And I hope it will change, especially in a practical sense. Let me say this to you. We know the scripture says these are evil days. And what's the advice? Since these are evil days, redeem the time. Every opportunity to know God's will must be taken advantage of. And I want to urge you, dear brethren, when voices of wickedness is very loud, 
unashamedly loud. We and our children will be overran by those voices unless we block them off as much as we can and fill our hearts more and more with the wisdom of God. And that's why I, as your pastor and this church, particularly pay attention to start the evening service, to give another time for you and your children to come and hear God's word. Don't take it lightly. Be in the tradition of true believers as we find them in the scriptures and in the tradition or the church history. And let us learn God's word. And I want to encourage you, come back. There are empty seats in the evening service. In fact, only about 100 people come. Uh, we have much more people to fill these seats and hear God's word. We are now studying the kings of Israel and Judah. And uh, we are finishing the life and reign of King Saul. Please come. It's never too late to begin and plenty of things to learn. If you are free, well, that's not the right, the right thing to say. You must be free. Please come and join us. Now, the second thing that I want to emphasize is uh, we also have a prayer meeting, by the way, adding to the first. And two of our sisters who gave testimony about the blessings are published today, so read that as well. Now, the second thing is about the Bible Witness Retreat. As Elder Ma, thank God for the safety God gave to Deacon Locke and I uh, in our short trip to East Malaysia, Sarawak, Kuching in particular, to look for a good hotel or resort for our retreat. Uh, we returned on Thursday night. Uh, many of the good hotels in Kuching are undergoing Serious renovations. And uh, by the way, the reason why we want to go to Kuching is because we have a small mission church there and we want to encourage them. And at the same time, we can also take time during this one week school break to learn God's word. And so Deacon Locke and I went around looking for places. Um, Thursday, uh, we told them our requirements, and they said they need uh, uh, at least uh, a day to answer us. But unfortunately, Friday became a public holiday in Sarawak, and so they couldn't send to us, and we had to get everything yesterday, Saturday. And so we, thank God, uh, we got a very good hotel at a reasonable rate. Now, you all should know the price of everything has gone up. The food, accommodation, everything has gone up. So we are very grateful that we were able to secure a very good hotel. I'm not absolutely sure. I need to see where Doc Deacon Locke is. Is it a five-star hotel? Where, where is he? Ah, okay. Okay. Now... We managed to get, and I was surprised, I had very little expectation to get a reasonable price from them because even those who are four-star were quoting very high. And so we have received um, a, a quotation that is very good uh, from a hotel known as Pullman, Pullman Hotel in, in Sarawak. It's a very well-maintained Paisa hotel. And we are able to give uh, a rate that's affordable to most of us for three days, $300 uh, for twin sharing. And for children between 5 to 12, it will be $200. And, but the thing is, uh, though it's affordable, you need to book your tickets to go there by flight. And remember, our dates are 6 to 8. That means Tuesday to Thursday. The reason why... We moved from Wednesday to Thursday to, to Tuesday to Thursday because the morning flights are only available on Tuesday. Wednesday, they are only evening flights to Kuching. And so we decided to have it from Tuesday to Thursday, uh, 6th September to 8th September. So today, when you get back home, quickly book your tickets. There are only two flights on Tuesday morning. And they are Air Asia and Scoot. They are one hour apart, and you can book them. Uh, the price may be a little 
more than usual because it's a school holiday week. Uh, nonetheless, I think you should be able to secure it within $200 to and fro. In some cases, it may go up. The earlier, the better. And uh, we thought we had to limit the number of uh, participants to 50, but with Pullman, they say that they can accommodate any number, uh, even up to 500. So we never had 500 anyway. So we, they are very happy to give us at that rate uh, whatever accommodation, uh, whatever number of people would come. By the way, I'm, I must not forget, um, there was Brother Simon from Kuching. Oh, yeah, you are there. Yeah, he went with us. Oh, thank God for him. Without him, we couldn't have traveled between all the hotels and resorts. Uh, Brother Simon is from Kuching and he's now living and serving here. He will go back now and then because his wife and uh, one of his sons, uh, two of his sons are still there. Uh, by the way, so Simon's help was extremely, extremely useful in uh, finding the right place. So we thank God for Brother Simon. And uh, just want to say that you must try and book your tickets quickly if you are interested. And today the link for your registration is given, so please register. And at the same time, book your ticket quickly so we can go together and rejoice in God's word. And I'm very excited to teach you the doctrine of repentance, which is an important doctrine because God's people will be always aware of the sins that beset them, and it is God's will that we would go to our Savior, who is ever ready to forgive us, so that we may trust Him. Repentance is an expression of faith in God, who is ready to forgive, and the power of Christ's blood that was shed for us. So it's a wonderful renewing doctrine which has helped me a great deal as I was studying recently on this topic to preach to you and I hope the Lord will bless us all. So please plan ahead quickly and for this retreat. Would you please arise now and join me in prayer. <clears throat> Let us pray. Wonderful Father in heaven, Thou art our rock, our fortress, our deliverer, our God, our strength, and in whom we trust. Thou art the buckler and the horn of our salvation, our high tower. We call upon Thee, O Lord, for Thou art worthy to be praised, and Thou alone can deliver us from our sins, and our enemies, the devil and the world, and all those hate thee and hate thy people. Our Savior has warned us that in this world we will have many, many tribulations. O oh Lord, yet he has promised to be our closest, nearest help. When there is trouble, we know the presence of God will be extended to us. He is nearer than the trouble that come by. We thank thee for being our very present help in trouble. O Lord, therefore, we once again renew our faith in thee, as we sang a while ago. When I fear that my faith will fail, I know Christ can hold me fast. And therefore, Lord, trusting in your everlasting arms that will not fail, that cannot fail, but shall be strong for the comfort and the deliverance of thy people, we cast our burdens before thee, knowing that thou would care for us. Thank you for gathering thy people in this manner. Many among us were sick over the past two weeks due to COVID infection. And some of our brothers and sisters and even little ones have fallen ill over the past week. We thank you for the healing that you have extended to those who have been sick. Thank you for the renewed strength both in body and in spirit. For those who are recuperating in their homes, we pray once again that you will stretch out your hand to heal them. That they may testify of the Lord's mercies toward us. Lord, we know of people who passed away because of the same infection that affected us. Some collapsed, 
and quickly died. We know it's because your appointed time has come in their life to leave this earth. None of us know exactly what day and what hour and what minute the Lord will call us home. Whether it's COVID or some other situation, thou can use those means to bring an end to our life on this earth, and thou will do it. And so, because he disappointed and man wants to die, and then the judgment, we pray that we will fear thee and will live the rest of our days to thy honor, not to serve our lust or the purposes and pleasures of this world, but to cease from being evil and doing that which is right, that which is pleasing to thy sight. O Lord, we thank thee that thou art a, a great friend to our souls. As again we sing, what a friend we have in Jesus to bear all our sorrows and cares. Teach us to pray, Lord. Teach us to pray. Not to fret in times of disappointments and worries and needs. When our hearts are painful, when our bodies are weak. O oh Lord, increase our faith, we pray. Forgive the doubts and fears and murmuring spirits that we have entertained within us. Cleanse us, O oh Lord. Renew us by thy word and by thy spirit once again that your people may rejoice in thee, that they may find thy comforting presence to be most delightsome. O oh Lord, help us. Please do not abandon us just as thou hast pro promised. Do not forsake us, O oh Lord. As we look to thee once again, Thou, may thou have, have pleasure to hear our voice and show thy marvelous loving kindness toward us all. By thy right hand, hold us up, O God, as we put our trust in thee. That we may go from here and serve you. Make us, O Lord, channels of your gospel blessings. That your goodwill may flow through us in beckoning sinners to come to Christ, that more and more people may be saved through the testimony of your people, both by their words and actions, they may show forth the goodness of our great and wonderful Father in heaven, who manifested his love through the giving of Christ, his only begotten Son, for our redemption. Now we also pray that you would prepare us as a congregation for the return of our Savior, that we will be ready at the like the wise virgins who prepared themselves for the coming of the bridegroom. Help us not to be foolish ones who deceive ourselves while we are unprepared, thinking that we will be ready for his coming. Help us to examine ourselves in your presence, to put aside every sin that easily beset us and every weight that hinder our progress, our walk with thee. May we put our faith in thee once again, the author and finisher of our faith. We can never fulfill our calling without your help. Thou alone is the finisher of the faith that you began in us. So we lean upon thee and ask that you will bless us. Increase our faith, increase our joy, Increase our hope and expectation in thee. Jesus, come quickly, for the world is not at all a friendly place for us. This world hate thee and hate thy people and everything that is done in your name. And they expect us to conform to their thinking. The worldliness, the wickedness have crept into the church, O oh God. Those who call themselves pastors have become ungodly, covetous, greedy, selling out the church for their own gain. O oh Lord, deliver us from such. May thy preachers in this church 
the elders in this church, remain faithful to you. Let the deacons serve the Lord with purity of heart. Let all thy people who bring the word of God to the children be blessed with a faithful spirit to study and to faithfully serve the Lord as they teach. Not let anyone speak his or her own mind, but the divine mind as it is revealed in the scriptures. May we not sin against thee. May we not become blasphemous and abominable in your sight, we pray. Keep us pure. Once again, we seek your blessings. Have mercy to forgive and to raise us up again to love you and to serve you. We pray for all those who came into this sanctuary this morning. We thank you for the 8 a.m. service and the Chinese service that's over and by now. We also pray for the afternoon services, such as the Filipino, Filipino Fellowship and the evening service. May the Lord bless us all as we come together in all these meetings. May the Lord's blessing be upon everyone so that they may say, oh, how good it is to be in the house of the Lord. May that be our desire, even as we meditate upon Psalm 15. Teach us, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please take your seats. Now, would you please turn your Bibles to the book of Psalms, Psalm 15. Please keep your Bibles open at Psalm 15. A Psalm of David, as the one liner preface says, a Psalm of David. Now, normally, we would have additional information in the preface, such as a Psalm of David to the chief musician. Uh, in such cases, it is written for the public use of that psalm, for the use of God's people in the congregation. Now, this, this particular psalm has also been used in the worship of Israel. And that's why it's in the collection of psalms. However, the title suggests that it did not begin with that intention, in that it began with the intention to teach David himself. This psalm is a spirit-guided personal reflection of David concerning one who can truly live in the Lord's house or his presence. Now that's reflected in verse 1. Take a look at verse 1. It says, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? And so as I stated the sermon title today, this is about the man in God's house, the man who lives in God's house, the man who abides or dwell in God's house. But the question must be asked, who truly abide in his tabernacle or in his house? Who? Just because you walk in to a church or in olden days into the temple of God, you don't become a true dweller of God's house. Who, O oh Lord? Now, interestingly, Psalm 15 has a question-answer format to present its, con its concept or its content. The question is twofold, a two-part question. Same truth repeated twice in these two questions. I read that again, verse 1. Lord, so it's a question addressed to God. God is to be the answer. I'll tell you why. But listen. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? You see, in the ancient people of Israel, 
you see a desire uh, to be approved by God as they enter his house to worship him. God has commanded the priests and even prophets to teach the people how to worship God, how to come to his house. A true worshiper who comes to God really want to know what he must do to be admitted into the presence of God and offer his obeisance in an acceptable manner. So the priest or the officer appointed would then instruct the worshiper how he could enter into the Lord's house and offer his thanksgiving to God. Now, throughout the scriptures, particularly in the Old Testament scriptures, we see God's instruction on how people should come to his presence. There were two major aspects to those instructions. One was the ritual cleanliness they should always maintain as they come to God's house. Or we want to say ceremonial rites they should accomplish, which is external. And there's also an internal cleansing that they should have. The external cleansing were representation of the internal cleansing that God wanted from them. There are many passages in the Old Testament, of course, even in the New Testament, that tells us God's expectation as we come to him. And I want to particularly bring to you two passages, two instances in the Old Testament where we see clear instructions as to how to come to God's presence to worship him. The first one is taken from Exodus 19. <coughs> Take a look at this. Exodus 19. The Lord instructs Moses to tell the people to come to his presence with readied, prepared bodies and hearts. Exodus 19, verse 10 to 15. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. And be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai. And thou shalt set bounds unto the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves, that ye go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever touches the mount shall be surely put to death. There shall not an hand touch it. But he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be beast or man. It shall not live when the trumpet soundeth long. They shall come up to the mound. And Moses went down from the mound unto the people and sanctified the people. And they washed their clothes. And he said unto the people, Be ready. Against the third day, come not at your wives. Even they were, such, they were asked not to abstain from sexual relationship even within marriage. That means the two days were given to them to be completely concentrated on God. Not to waste their time entertaining one another but totally dedicated to God. This is a very special occasion when the Lord came down on Mount Sinai, in Mount Sinai, to visit his people and to declare his word to them. But you can see God told them to cleanse themselves, to wash their clothes, and sanctify their hearts, and come with the fear of God. If any would break it, even dead, to come too close to the mound where God shall appear, they will be struck to death. 
a fearsome God because He is holy, He is glorious. His infinite greatness must be respected. And without reverence and holiness, no one is allowed to come to his presence. He welcomes his people. That's interesting to note. God welcomes his people. He requires them to come, but not as they like. Come on his terms. When we come to worship God, remember what Jesus himself said in his conversation with the Samaritan woman. We must worship God in spirit and in truth. Truth is a reference to God's word. And our heart must be sincere, being strengthened by the Holy Spirit to follow the scriptures. If we don't do that, if we come in our own flesh and its desires or its laziness, then God will reject us, doubt not. He may not kill you immediately today, but you are marked out for eternal destruction, even though you come to his presence. And you will be seen as an abuser of God's house, even the church. Just because you anyhow come into the church, it doesn't mean you are going to heaven. You make sure you behave in the presence of the great God who had mercy toward you and send his son, Jesus Christ, to be your savior that you reverence him and with thanks, thankful heart of a sinner who is saved by grace, you appear before God. Not in the pride of your greatness. There is nothing actually, but because we are so prideful, we think we, are so much, we have so much to show off in the church. And instead of giving glory to God, we seek our own glory. With prideful heart, we come only to be destroyed at the end. You will not abide in the presence of God. You will be marked out to be destroyed. And so, dear friends, the Bible actually tells us that God is very particular that his glory, his holiness, will not be scorned at. It will not be defied by those who come to his presence. Come to reverence your God. Come to worship him in the beauty of his holiness. Not for your pleasure. Some people come to church to be pleased, to be, to be entertained. And there are pastors and leaders of the church go around with a survey form. How do you, what do you feel about our worship service? How do you feel about today's worship? How do you feel about today's message? Who bothers about your feelings? I pray that in this church, nobody thinks about your feelings, but everybody think about what God thinks about us, how we behave before him. That's what matters. Here is a second instance I want to bring to your attention before we get into the text itself, which is taken from David's own life. After David became a king and all blessings of God were, uh, were given to him, he was very, very thankful and he wanted to make sure, according to God's grace given to him, he would advance Israel's worship forward. When he realized that God helped him to capture Jerusalem from the hands of the Jebusites, and he was moved in his heart, of course, by the Spirit of God and his guidance, that place must be dedicated for the worship of Israel. So Jerusalem was set aside by David, of course, under the guidance of God, to be the center of worship in Israel. And that fact is never disputed. Even today you know the fight between the Muslims and the Jews for Jerusalem is based on the fact that God, through David, has set aside Mount Zion, which is Jerusalem actually, for God's service, God, for God's worship. And when Jesus comes again, we know, he will reign from Jerusalem for a thousand years. And so Jerusalem is the appointed place. And David was the one whom God used to secure that place for the Israelites. So when David thought about it, he felt 
it's very important that the ark of God must be brought to Jerusalem. But then prior to his coming to the throne, the ark of God was taken away by the Philistines because Eli the high priest had two sons who were wicked and they took the ark of God to the battle against Philistines and God has punished Israelites for their ungodliness and the ark of, the God, ark of God was taken away by the Philistines. And he was on his way back. Philistines knew it's going to be a curse for them, so they wanted the uh, ark of God to be sent back. And it was back in Israel's ground, but it had to be brought to Jerusalem. And so that's a place that I'm going to bring your attention now. 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6. <clears throat> we read here about David's attempt to bring the ark of God to Jerusalem. Mount Zion, because that's where he prepared a place for the Ark of the Covenant. However, due to carelessness in transporting the Ark, a tragic death occurs. You read that in verses 6 and 7 of 2 Samuel chapter 6. 2 Samuel chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. And when they came to Nachon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God, took hold of it, for the oxen shook it, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error. In the presence of God, ark of God represented God and his truth, and his justice, and his presence, Uzzah didn't respect it, reverence the fact that the ark of God was intended to be his presence in the midst of the people. He touched it. God struck him with death for his error. There he died by the ark of God. Worship is dangerous, okay? Worship can kill us, especially when we approach the great God with careless behavior, with irreverence and sinful hearts. Don't take God for granted. Yes, he's gracious. Yes, he's good and kind and benevolent. But that doesn't mean he can close his eye against your wicked behavior that defies his authority and holiness. No. There's a parallel passage where this incident is recorded, and that's 1 Chronicles 13. May I call your attention there now? 1 Chronicles chapter 13. Same incident, 1 Chronicles 13. Verses 10 to 12. <clears throat> Verse 10 of First Chronicles 13. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and it smote him because he put his hand to the ark, and there he died before God. You see that? In Second Samuel chapter 6 we read, there he died by the ark of God. Now the same incident is reported in verse 10 of 1 Chronicles 13 as he died where? Before God. So by the side of the ark of God means what? Before God. It was a, a symbol of God's presence. And when they abused with irreverence, by touching it, they had to pay a high price, especially that man, Uzzah. However, this man's death was not only an admonition against that man's careless spirit, but the entire nation was to be warned of God's anger. And so we read in verse 11, David as saying, uh, David was displeased because the Lord made a breach upon Uzzah. Wherefore, that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. David was what? Afraid of God. 
Did you read that? Verse 12, David was afraid of God that day, saying, how shall I bring the ark of God home to me? In other words, how can I have God at home with me? The concern is, how can I be in his presence? How can God be with me? How can I be with God? How can I be in communion with God? How can I rejoice the presence of, in the presence of God? That's the real concern of David's heart. Not only that day, but the rest of his life, he was filled with this concern. How can I dwell in the presence of God? How can I be in communion with my God? What shall I do that God may be pleased to have me with him and his presence be extended to me? Later, in the 15th chapter, of First Chronicles, we read about how David, having learned from the previous tragedy, how holily and reverently he should approach God and his ark. And he commands the Levites, the priests, to be sanctified so that they may carry the ark to the tent he made in Mount Zion. Take a look at verse 12 of First Chronicles 15. 1 Chronicles verse 15. And he said unto them, Ye are the chief of the fathers of the Levites. Sanctify yourselves, both ye and your brethren, that ye may bring up the ark of the Lord God of Israel unto the place that I have prepared for it. Verse 13. Because ye did it not at the first, the Lord our God made a breach upon us. Did you see that? God our Lord made what? A breach upon Uzzah. No, upon us. God's action against Uzzah was an action against us. For that we sought him not after the due order. I hope you underline that. The problem was this. Underlying problem that caused the death of that man in such a tragic way was because we sought him, meaning we sought the Lord, not after the due order. Now, who appoints the order? Who gives the order? Who ordains the order in which we should worship him? God himself. God has clearly spoken how we should come to his presence. And anyone who disregard the due order commanded by God is a fool who is calling forth God's curse upon himself. That's why I said worship can be dangerous if you approach God's presence with undue attitude. What is due unto God, you must give. That is reverence and a cleansed heart. You know, dear brethren, this has been the main concern of David in many of his writings. There is another psalm which really reflects the same spirit as he shows in, verse, in Psalm 15. And that's Psalm 24. You can turn there very quickly and take a look at this. Psalm 24, verses 3 to 6. David says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Exactly the same type of questions with the same concern. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Now the hill of the Lord is the Mount Zion. Jerusalem, where God has appointed, through David, the place of worship. So the concern is not where should we worship. It is settled forever. For the Jews, it was the place called Mount Zion or Jerusalem. So the question is not where shall we worship, but who can worship? How can we prepare ourselves to be true worshipers? That's the issue. Of course, he continued to say, He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sown deceitfully, 
He shall receive the blessing from the Lord and righteousness from God of his salvation. This is a generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. So the concern is answered by God. Both in Psalm 15 and Psalm 24. I'm going to leave Psalm 24 for our latest study. But come back to Psalm 15. You see, both Psalms 15 and 24 have the same concern. They have much in common while they answer the same concern. But the most important thing is that both Psalms teach us how to conduct ourselves as true worshippers of God in his presence. How to conduct. Now, as we take note of the instructions given to us in Psalm 15. One of the most moving thought in verse 1 and the following verses is that God acts as the host of his people in the time of worship. God is the host and we are the guests. We come to his house, not he coming to our house. We go to his house. You read verse 1 again? What does it say? Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? It is his house. His majesty resides there. His sovereign authority with all the glorious perfections of God, God resides there. And we should not ever think we can just run into it as we like and desecrate the place. We are not even worthy to stand at this gate and look toward it. How much more? He welcomes us and puts within us a desire to enter into his presence and dwell there, abide there. Remember, twice we are told that it is his house, thy tabernacle, O Lord, and thy holy hill. It is God-given place, and interestingly, thy tabernacle, the synonymous word next, in the next question is thy holy hill. Hill. How come the place is holy? The presence of God. It's not man made holiness. It's thy holy hill. It is the perfect, pure, undiluted holiness of God. Dear brethren, if you are a child of God, as David is, thankful for the forgiveness and salvation, when you come to God's presence, you won't be casual about the access you have received to God's presence to worship him. This is an holy, this is an holy, holy affair. This is a holy time, hour. But again, you can see when you look into that question, or those two questions, two-part questions, that David's concern was not about an hour of worship or half a day of worship. Pay attention to the verbs used here. Lord, who shall abide? Now, interestingly, the Hebrew word translated abide is gur, pronounced gur. J-U-R, a long U sound. Gur, or double O, R. Gur. And that word is translated about 50 over times, to be more exact, 58 times in the King James Bible as sojourn. Sojourn. Only 12 times translated as dwell. One of it is here. Now, the actual meaning of the Hebrew word gur is sojourn, meaning you stay put, live long in a place. It, it shows not just a rest like, oh, I sleep here. That's not what it means. Your activity is in this place. 
So when it says, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? The question is, O oh Lord, who can really live in your presence? Live in your house. It is much more than rendering worship on the Lord's day or the Sabbath day. It is, yes, that and more. We render our worship and then we don't stop worshiping. When we worship on the Lord's day, it's the beginning of a week-long worship. In fact, I can say it's the beginning of a lifelong worship. Every time I come to God's house, like this day, I'm renewing myself to be his worshiper for the rest of my life. If God gives me another Lord's Day, next Sunday when I come here, I'm going to renew myself and say, Lord, I shall be your worshiper all the days of my life. That's the concern. The man in God's house, the man who never leaves God's house. And that's what a Christian is. A Christian is not one who comes into church on a Sunday morning and then forgets about God and live the way he wants. No, he is called to abide in his God and his presence. You and I, dear brethren, we are in this world not to do the business of the world. We are, do, we are here to do everything according to God's will. We are not to give ourselves to the thinking of the world. Whether we study or teach or practice medicine or drive or play a game or eat or drink, everything is to the glory of God. Our concern must be, oh Lord, I want to be a true worshiper because you saved me for that purpose. To be a true worshiper of God. And that's why Jesus told the Samaritan woman, who was so concerned about where should I worship so that God would accept. And he asked, she asked, Samaritan woman asked Jesus, where should I worship? In Jerusalem or in this place, in Samaria? Jesus, of course, answered, in Jerusalem. And the salvation is of the Jews, but the time is coming. Neither here nor there. Anywhere you can worship, but you must spirit, you must worship him in spirit and in truth. Dear brethren, the concern about worship is not the music. It's not whether we got electric guitar or piano or drums. Those things are nothing to do with worship. It's about your heart. Whether it is ready to abide with God or not. Otherwise, your music is a despicable thing in the sight of God. He hates it. Your lips draw nigh unto God, but your heart is far from him. So the question, the chief question of every true child of God, who is like David, who is thankful for the forgiveness of sins, come to him and say, O oh Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? Would I be killed because I come to your presence not according to the due order? May I remind you, brethren, David was a man with a passion to dwell in God's house. You remember some of these verses I'm going to just quickly read. See whether you remember them. Remember David said in one psalm, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Where is it? Psalm 23, verse 6. I will dwell in the house of the Lord, not for one hour. Forever. Gur, sojourn in the Lord's house. You never live as though you are far from God. Wherever you be, whether you are on your bed, getting ready to sleep, whether you are sitting alone, or whether you are talking to friends, or doing business, or cooking, or eating, you always want to remember as a child of God, you are welcome into his presence to live as the child of your father. Be holy as he is holy. Everywhere you live in his presence. 
sanctified by his greatness, by the knowledge of his greatness, his awesome holiness, you are brought to a proper behavior that continues all the days. Listen, a psalm that we sometimes sing, Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. Now, what's the next phrase? You sing with me most of the time. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Did you hear that? Not now and then. Not just on feast day. All the days of my life, I must dwell in the house of the Lord. That's Psalm 27, verse 4. Now consider this, Psalm 61, verse 4. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. It's a continuous existence in the presence of God. A perpetual abiding. Verse 7 of the same psalm. Psalm 61, verse 7. He shall abide before God forever. That's what a true man of God will be. Abide before God. Always acknowledging the Great presence of God, living in proper conduct of oneself. That's what worship is. Worship is not just singing a few songs. But if those songs come from a disciplined heart, a heart that is disciplined according to God's word, then it is acceptable to him. Otherwise, your voice is a disturbance to his holiness. And that is your destruction. Psalm 91, again a psalm that we sing now and then. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He that abideth in the secret place of the Most High. We are always in that private communion with God. Always in the secret place, meaning that close, intimate place that we have by the grace of God. Always having access to his presence. There we and our God spend our time together. Even in our public life, we are in the secret place of the Most High. Because we enjoy that communion that God gives to us through Christ. You see, these are the voices of men like David in the book of Psalms. What is their chief concern? I must dwell in the house of God forever. I must abide in the house of God. That's the man in the God's house. This, these two questions belong to the true children of God. You know, Psalm 84 verse 1 says, How amiable are thy tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. How amiable. Our desire is to be in his presence. Your tabernacles, O oh Lord. Your, you know, I may be in my house. It can be a hut or it can be a palace-like house. What does it matter if we are not in the house of God? If you are living in a little hut, but you know you are in the presence of God, the hut doesn't bother you because you are in the joy of the presence of God. And you will say, how amiable are thy tabernacles? You will sing better than those who know not God and live in the luxury of this life. It is not the house you live. It's not the circumstances that you are, find yourself in. But the awareness of the glorious presence of God. And then you shall say, how amiable are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts. What a grace. What a blessing that you have extended to me through Jesus Christ, that I may dwell in your presence. Ah, oh, may my mind be preoccupied with this concern, that I will be a man in God's house. God hosts me. He welcomes me. He gives me access to his perfection. And live in the joy of the sight and the sound of his greatness, his authority, his goodness. Ah, sanctify me, God. Oh, give me a closer love and experience 
of thee. Well, for that two-part question that David gave it to the Lord, God gives a 12-part answer. Now, don't get scared. We will go through that fast. Now, why must I ask God? Because it's God's house. You are called to live in his presence. He determines the decorum, the conduct of his people. Not we. We are visitors. We are given grace to access. But remember, the house belonged to God. Of course, this whole world belonged to him. The earth and the fullness thereof belong to the Lord. We are still in his presence. Jesus said to the Samaritan woman, it doesn't matter where you are. What matters is that you remember, I'm God. There's only one God, and I'm eternal spirit, and therefore you must worship me in spirit and in truth. That's the decorum. God's spirit invites us to God's presence, and when he gives us access, we abide by his truth, not by our wishes and whims, not by what you want. It doesn't matter what you want. We are not interested. God is not interested in your thinking. God is interested that you take his thoughts Yours are perishing thought, marred with your own sin, your selfishness, your pride. God is least concerned about what I think. God is least concerned about what you think. He is most concerned that you think what he thinks. So you will pray, not my will, but thine be done. That's the exact prayer of every true worship. Not my will, but thine be done. And we come to know it. And so God gives us an answer to that question. He's revealing his will as to how we should abide in his house. You want to know? Let's pay attention to verses 2 to 5. Verse 2 all the way to the first part of verse 5. God gives a 12-part answer to the two-part question in verse 1. <clears throat> and actually... <clears throat> In these 12 responses that God gives in four verses, two to five, answers are given positively and negatively. Verse two has positive answers. Verse three gives you the negative things you should know in conducting yourself. And then he goes back to positive things again in verse four. And then he mentions some negative things that we should take care of in verse 5. Positive, negative, positive, negative. Let's pay attention to them. Verse 2. Number 1. He that walketh uprightly. Walk means live your lifestyle, the way you are, the way you conduct yourself. You walk uprightly. What does that mean? In Exhibiting uprightness. God looks at you and he sees you as upright, meaning you obey his word. You're right with God. You are not one who defies God. You are not one who turns away from God. You order your life with integrity, loyalty to God. You're upright. So a man who truly... Abide in God's presence will always have a commitment to be upright. Not in his own mind, but in God's mind. You are concerned about what God thinks about you. Your thoughts, your words, your actions, uh, your entertainment. Everything is according to God's will. If it is not God's will, you don't want it to be part of your life. Because to be partaking in those things would mean that you are not a worshiper of God, but a worshiper of the things of this world the pleasure of your heart. And so we have to be upright, exhibiting loyalty and integrity before God. And the second thing is that one who is, abides in God's presence will work righteousness. He worketh righteousness. Of course, if you are upright before God, you will act righteously. You will not engage in unrighteous things. You act righteously, exhibiting 
God's righteousness and justice in this earth. A third thing that God says about those who abide in his presence is that he will speak truth in his heart. Speaketh truth in his heart. That's quite an interesting statement. Speaks truth in his heart. You see, what he says with his mouth is not different from what he thinks in his heart. He is not a, a duplicit person. He is not a double-minded uh, person. You know, he's, some people say, oh, I hate you in the heart. But then the word comes in, oh, good to see you. How are you? But in the heart, that's not how you speak. You order your heart to be right with God, and so you can tell the truth as it is. Speaks with true conscience. Your conscience is right with God, and so you speak with a genuine, true conscience in the sight of God. Remember, it's very important that we don't speak without a heart that doesn't back it up as acceptable before God. Before we speak, we must see whether our conscience is thinking correctly in a way God is pleased with. If your heart is not thinking the right way, don't speak. You repent of your heart's condition. Be silent. And know that God rules and reigns. So a person who worships God properly will not speak with an evil conscience. He speak truth in his heart. He aligns his thoughts to God's word and then speaks accordingly. A fourth advice, which is found in verse 3, is put in negative. Four, five, and six advices from God are in negative way of expression. He that backbiteth not with his tongue. He backbiteth not with his tongue, meaning to say he does not hurt people with his words. He does not slander people with his tongue. He does not tread over people with his tongue. You know, some people stab and then step on people with the words. The words are so, so destructive. They speak with revenge and, and destruction. Even when they joke, they mean to really give it to you. And that's not how Christians who worship God behave and talk. He backbiteth not with his tongue. Next, number five, no doeth evil to his neighbor. He does no harm to his fellow man. He think of what good I can do to my neighbor. The neighbor may not be very courteous. The may not, he may not be even a helpful person. And he may prefer to live as a stranger to you. He may not even greet you. He may do even harm to you. But in your heart, never ever think evil against your neighbor. How can you do that when God loved you? though you were enemy, an enemy of God. If you live in that holy and gracious God's presence, which is your chief concern, then of course you will be maintaining a proper attitude, which is just like your Father in heaven. No evil. Even if your neighbor do anything evil, you should overcome it with good. Don't render evil to evil, for evil, but good. Now the sixth advice, again in the negative terms, he says, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. In other words, he doesn't scoff and scorn at his neighbor. He doesn't dumb reproach on your family, the family next to you, or the friend who worked next to you. You are kind-hearted in your speech toward them. 
you are gracious, you are appreciative, you are thankful, you are encouraging, you do not reproach your neighbor. There are people who engage in trash talking. You know, when you have business competition, when you have some kind of competition or rivalry in your workplace or in your school where you study, you tend to reproach one another. Never do that. Never do that. God wants us to be gracious and kind-hearted, courteous. Those who love God and are controlled by the presence of God know how to conduct themselves and how to treat fellow men. We are told to do good even to those who persecute us. And if you want to be of that kind of Christian, always remember you are living in the presence of God and he will help you trust him, follow him. Look at Jesus, how he did not threaten those who threatened him, how he did not revile those who reviled him, how he graciously spoke to them and prayed that God would forgive them at the end. And that's the spirit we, we should have. Remember Stephen who was stoned to death. How did he pray? Though he warned them against their sin, but when they did evil to him, he prayed just like Jesus prayed for those who crucified him. Stephen also prayed for those who murdered him, that God would be merciful to forgive them. Now we shall look at verse 4. Again, positively, he states four things in verse 4. So we have seen six already, and we see the next four. That will make it, make it ten. First, in this list, Number six, in whose eyes a wild person is condemned. In other words, a man who lives in God's presence will reject the wicked. A wild person is a reprobate, one who is given to sin and has no regard for God, live in utter wickedness, no concern about righteousness. Oh, dear brethren, we cannot accept those persons. They may be our brothers or sisters, or parents, or, you know, children. But if they are wicked, we cannot speak for them. They are wicked. Doesn't mean we cannot show love toward them, but we cannot encourage them in their sins. We cannot leave them alone, but must reprove the works of darkness. And so, a uh, True worshipper of God will not be silent when sin is committed. A true worshipper of God will do exactly what God would do. He would rebuke sin. And that's what we should do. We shouldn't go out with people who are living in sin and be entertained by them. And then for, take photo and put in Facebook. See who I had a cup of coffee with? No? That's not what it is. Next, number seven. He honoreth them that fear the Lord. When you reject the reprobate, you respect those who love God. He honoreth them that fear the Lord. True worshippers must engage in mutual honor. I must honor you because you came to worship the great God whom I worship. How nice it is to have you with me to praise the same God whom we respect. If I respect my God, I will respect everyone who respects God. And now let's look at number nine. He that sweareth to his own hurt. What does that mean? A man who lives in God's presence will swear to his own hurt. In other words, he holds himself accountable. He's not try trying to find excuses and ways to escape from his responsibility. He's a man of responsibility. In other words, if you truly worship God and serve God, 
You must be least concerned about your own safety, but most concerned about God's glory. And for that matter, you must be able to pick up the cross and follow Him. You're not trying to save your skin at the expense of your God. You would give yourself totally to be loyal to your God, to worship Him, to serve Him, and to keep the office that God gave to you, whether in your family or in the public place or in the church, in honor of God. I may be a pastor, but if I'm here to make money for myself, I'm a bad fellow who is not a worshiper of God, but are an abuser of God's privileges. I must be a pastor at any cost because God called me. Whether I am paid or not, whether I am treated honorably or not, whether people will spit on me or not, it does not matter. I must accept all this to serve my glorious God. And if I commit a mistake, I must not give excuse, must own up to it. That's the loyalty that I vow to my God. If we don't have that loyalty, we are wicked men. You know, I mean, just to give you an example, it hurts me so much sometimes to think of people who are really, really having no integrity. You know, they come for marriage, husband and wife. They, they take their vows. They look at one another. I always say, look at one another and take your vow. Sometimes they forget the vow, so they want me to read it, so they repeat. And in the process, they look at me and say, don't look at me when you, when you make your vow. Look at your spouse. You're telling her in the name of God. But after that, I want separation. I want divorce. And justify it. Jesus said, it's the hardness of your heart. It's the hardness of your heart that make you desiring divorce. And I hope none of you will be part of anyone's divorce. Don't ever speak a word in encouragement of those who break their covenant with God. It's a damnable thing to do. Even when Hosea had a wife who prostituted herself, what did God say? Forgive her. Take her back. Such is the covenant of God. He shows so much covenant of love for us. How many times we have betrayed him? How many times we have treacherously acted? Didn't he forgive us? Your ability to remain faithful in places God has appointed is not in yourself. It is in God. When you are so drained of your energy, ideas, and emotions, go on your knees and worship your God who called you and put that burden on your shoulder. Don't be a quitter. There are some who come into the church to serve God. A little bit of shake-up. They want to run with the tail in between the wing, uh, between the legs. Whew, they flee like a covered. And they say, oh, I don't care. I'm ready to die. Whatever God wants to do, do it to me. Fools, sir. Absolute fools. Don't anyhow touch God's name and his kingdom. You better behave in due order. A man whom God has called to serve him must serve God with his life. That's why it's called full time and a total commitment to God. It's not as you like. You cannot write your manner of service to God. It is God who determines. You give yourself. If you are a husband, you are not the one who decides how to be a husband. It is God who determines. Sometimes his providence may give you a very difficult wife. Sometimes God may give you difficult children. Sometimes God may give you very difficult circumstances. And you often ask, why, why this happened to me? Why this happened to me? It doesn't matter what happens to you. What happens is how you behave in the presence of God. How many godly servants, how many godly women have suffered in silence, beating, abuses, utter 
discouraging words, shame, all for the glory of God. Remember Hannah? How she was maligned by the second wife of the husband. She made no commotion at home. She went to the house of God, poured her heart before God. Even Eli, the priest, seeing it, thought she lost her mind. She was a drunken woman. woman. That's what he thought. But she explained, no, sir, no. This is the burden of my heart. She came back. God blessed her. She came back not to create a big hoo-ha. I'm more spiritual than you, you know, Penaniah. I prayed, you know, even the priest was surprised. Now, you want to fight? I'm here. Fight. No. She didn't take it up to her husband. She yielded. She conceived. Samuel. Dear brethren, often we blame others who did not do well. We blame our circumstances for quitting. Please, if you swear, if you make a vow, take it to your own hurt. Then you are honorable. Jesus did it, isn't it? He said, not my will, but thine be done. He gave his life to fulfill his covenant. We didn't make the covenant. God made the covenant of grace. And he took upon himself the curse, not because he did wrong, but our curse was laid upon him. You remember that? That's Jesus. He was hurt. He was wounded because he made a covenant with us. When you make a covenant with your church, when you make a covenant with your spouse, when you stand in God-appointed place with the commitment to obey what God has given to you and be a responsible person, then be ready to die in that place honorably in honor of your God who called you. Otherwise, it's a shameful thing. You are not a man who loves God and fear Him. You can talk about whatever you want. You may try to show that you are a great theologian. It just won't work in God's sight. And also, lastly in verse 4, the tenth thing that God says to those who want to know how to abide in God's presence permanently as his worshiper, he changeth not. He's not fickle. He's not one who flips now and then. He's steadfast in his loyalty to God. He's a trustworthy steward. He is not one who says one thing and changes his mind next moment. He changes not. Not fickle. He finds his strength in the Lord. Then again we come to verse 5. The last two things that God tells us how to conduct as true worshippers of our great God. Verse 5. He that putteth not out his money to usury. He's not greedy. When he sees people in need, he will not say, oh, I'm richer than him now. I can lend him some money and increase my savings. Well, I'm not talking about business. I'm talking about helping people in need. That's what God is talking about here. In fact, in the scriptures, we are given very clear guidelines how we should lend and how we should help people. Uh, <coughs> in the book of Deuteronomy, <coughs> the Lord has given some very clear guidelines. Uh, turn to chapter 23 of Deuteronomy. <coughs> Chapter 23 of Deuteronomy, verses 19 and 20. Thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother. 
usury of money, usury of victuals, usury of anything that is lent upon usury. Unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand to in the land whither thou goest to possess it. So to a brother in need. In other words, God said to the Jews, if you see another Jew in need and he asks for help, you give your help, whether it's money or other things, but never to gain from it because he's your brother. You have it, what you have it, because God gave it to you. And when God gave it to you, he didn't ask for interest from you. God gave it generously, more than you deserve. And so when you see a needy person, you remember this, God is sending him to you so that what God gave to you now can be extended to him. Don't think of helping a brother for extra money or extra gain in anything. Lend it because God lent to you. Never for exorbitant interest. Well, people who deal with business matters, well, Bible allows that. You can have interest for business purpose. But in helping one another, never do it. When you give, even if you lend it, meaning to say when the man has, he can return to you. But if he is in a situation where he cannot give back to you, don't chase after him. Let it be like God has used you to give to him. Forget about it. Of course, hope that if you borrow, you will return. The Bible says the wicked borrows and never return. So if you borrow and God help you to return, you better make sure you return. But as far as lending is concerned, we who are blessed by God, when we lend a brother something that God has blessed us with, which he doesn't have and he is in need of, let's give it with a thankful spirit for God who blessed us so abundantly. Not for gain. There are more such um, clear teachings on lending money, but we don't have the time to go through all of those passages. Some other time we can learn that. But remember, God forbids to lend money for exorbitant interest, especially to the poor. In fact, one part of the scripture clearly teaches us that. You know, if you take something as collateral from a poor person, please don't hold it in your hand for too long. In those days, they would ask the outer garments to be given as a token. But the Bible is very clear. If you take that cloth from him, that piece of garment from him, how can he warm himself? Being a poor man, he won't have money to buy another garment. So give it back to him. Let him be comfortable. Never ever secure money at the expense of poor people's comfort. Never do that. The Lord will bless you. That's a promise. Give. Give just as God gives to you. Because you live in His presence. You're blessed by Him. He will bless you continually. Why do you doubt? Why do you want to squeeze out of a poor man? And finally, as we come to verse 5, the second part of it says, the last counsel, number 12, nor take the reward against the innocent. In other words, you are not for sales. <laughs> you cannot be purchased with bribes. To harm others, you cannot be bought with bribes. You do not take reward against the innocent. You are not moved by rewards. You are moved by God in whose presence you live. He is your inheritance. 
He is your reward. His perfection is your delight. You take such glory in being like your God. And you thank him for that. Dear brethren, two-part question, 12-part answers from God, and one-part assurance. At the end of verse 5, what's that? He that doeth these things shall never be moved. He that doeth these things, all of them, shall never be moved. How I wish I have one more hour to preach. <laughs> this particular phrase, thou shalt not be moved, is found in the book of Psalms and Proverbs. It is an assurance that God will be your defense and your help. You will be established as the child of God who worship and serve his purposes in his kingdom. Neither the devil nor the world can ever thwart the purpose of, for which you are called and welcomed into his presence. May God make you an unmovable person. Nothing worried and fretting about. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Unmovable, steadfast in your God. May each of us thrive. And may this congregation rejoice in his presence. May you be the man and the woman who always abide in God's house. May God be praised. Let's all arise and sing our final hymn in response to the message we heard. Hymn number 14. Send out thy light and thy truth that I may be guided into thy holy hill. Let's sing with joy. love thee, Lord, because thou hast first loved us. Thou hast welcomed us to thy presence. Oh, who would give such mercy and loving kindness as, as such as that thou hast shown us. Thou art very great in thy love for us, so full of kindness and compassion, tenderness and patience and forbearance. Thou hast not dealt with us according to our sin. 
you still welcome us into thy tabernacle, where your perfections are fully shown. We pray, Father, that this opportunity that thou hast given to us through thy word will not be lost on us. We pray that your mercy and grace will be received with fullness of repentance and faith, and that we will repent of our shortcomings and failures and renew ourselves in humble prayer to do all things in due order, like David himself, though in ignorance made a great mistake which end up in the tragedy of, of death. He had renewed himself, advised as the priest to conduct all things according to God's word and how thou hast blessed that effort. The ark was brought to the Mount Zion and the people rejoiced and praised and worshipped God. May that joy be ours every day, every week and all the days of our life, that we may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days, one thing have we desire, O Lord, from your good hand, and that we seek after, that we may worship you in the beauty of holiness and become true servants of thine. Thus each and every one of us, as we go through this difficult world, shall remain unmovable, settled by our God for his glory. May thy blessing be abundantly upon thy people. May the grace, love, and peace of the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost abide upon each of you till Jesus returns. Amen. Take your seats. The worship is over. Please give yourself in thanksgiving and consecration in response to God's word in quiet prayers before you leave. God be with you all.